Yes, that was a satisfying sound of a rotary encoder with indents. And I called this video something like uh, rotary encoders, blah, 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 my way. Um, my way is definitely not the only way. It's maybe not even the best way. It's just my way. So uh, let's dive in. That's what's currently on the breadboard. You have the rotary encoder here. Yeah, it also has a push button switch, but we ignore that for the moment. But it has two more switches which will open and close uh, when you turn the knob. And what these switches do, they give you a so-called quadrature encoding of the rotation. So this is an incremental encoder that is dependent on yeah how you rotate it they open and close. And so we get a signal we are using to pull up resistors here. So if the switch is open, yeah, the output is high. If the switch is closed, the output is low. And the 10K value of those resistors is just from the data sheet of the manufacturer. And I'm using a brand name incremental encoder from Born's um, PEC 11R. And yeah, uh, regarding the resistors, you see here there is a contact rating in the datasheet which gives you 10 milliamps at 5 volts DC. So at 5 volt, the lowest resistor value you could use safely is 500 ohms, which would give you exactly the 10 milliamps. However, there's no need to stress the switches. So yeah, 10K give you half a milliamp, and this should be enough to drive, a, for example, a microcontroller, an Arduino. Anyway, also in the data sheet, they give you the quadrature, quadrature output table uh, that is uh, describing the dance these two switches do when you turn the knob. So the A signal, you see, yeah, this is clockwise. You can read that clockwise from the left to the right. The A signal comes on earlier than the B signal or the A switch is actuated earlier than the B switch. And then as you further rotate, the A switch closes yeah, earlier than the B switch. And it's exactly the other way around when you turn it counterclockwise and you read that diagram from the right to the left. So the B signal comes on first and then the A signal. And yeah, you probably have seen these nice graphics a lot in, uh, if you ever Googled for uh, rotary encoders. But let's have a look at the oscilloscope, how that looks in real life. And I will try to single capture a turn clockwise. Ah, there we are, let's zoom in. The first thing you notice is that the signal is inverted. Yeah, that diagram was given for the switches being on or off, open or closed, but we are using pull up resistors. So if the switch is open or off, we get a high. When the switch is closed, yeah, or on, we get a low. You could, in theory, use pull down resistors, yeah, uh, connect the switches to 5 volts and the other end of the switches uh, via the resistors to ground to get rid of that inversion. But yeah, traditionally you, you, traditionally you use pull up resistors, but there's no real reason why you need to use pull up. You could also use pull down. Anyway, the second thing you notice is that the timing <laughs> is not as nice as in the diagram or in any other diagrams that are shown on the interweb. So here my channel A, this is only very short pulses. And yeah, uh, on my channel B, I have um, longer pulses, sometimes uh, 
substantially longer pulses, but uh, that's not really a problem. The important thing here is that there is some kind of phase shift between the signals. So that was clockwise and you see when we have a falling edge here, yeah, it's normally high, pull up resistors. When you have a falling edge here on channel A, channel B is already low. Yeah, falling edge, channel B is already low. Okay, let's single capture a counterclockwise turn. Huh. Let's zoom in. You notice right away that now <laughs> our channel 1 pulses are longer compared to our channel B pulses. But again, that doesn't matter. Because as before, when we just look at the falling edges of our channel A, we see, yeah, channel A, the edge is falling and this time counterclockwise Channel B is already high at that point. Yeah, falling edge, channel B is already high. Falling edge, channel B is already high. But there lurks another problem within these signals. And uh, yeah, let me zoom in and show you. Like any other mechanical switch, it bounces and you don't want to feed that uh, into the input of a microcontroller. I mean, you could, there's something called software debouncing, but I don't like software debouncing. Anyway, the manufacturer provides us in the datasheet with a suggested filter circuit and you see I have here the uh, 10K pull-ups. They are already in place. Yeah, my two switches inside the encoder and then they place an RC filter here at our output signal. 10 kilo ohms and 0.01 microfarads or 10 nanos. So let's do that. So I built up exactly that circuit on the breadboard. Yeah, we still have our two 10k pull-ups and then we have an RC filter 10k 10 nano for each channel and we're measuring now here at the output of the filters, our channel A and B. So let's single capture those new signals. Okay, let's zoom in. Right off the bat, that signal looks much cleaner even on that time scale. So let's go to a smaller time scale and examine in detail. And that really looks good. Uh, let's zoom in even more. So there's definitely absolutely no bouncing left here on the signal, but they are a little bit asymmetric, aren't they? I mean, uh, the rise from low to high is quite slow, while uh, yeah, the fall from high to low is, yeah, okay. The reason for that being, if the switch closes, the capacitor is discharged via a 10K resistor to ground, while when the switch opens again, the resistor is charged via two 10K resistors, so 20K. So yeah, the time constant for <laughs> uh, charging going back up to high is twice as big as the one for going from high to low. I don't like that. I made some little changes to the circuit. Uh, let's single, yeah, I'm already on single. Let's single capture that and have a look at the signals. Now our falling and rising edges are, yeah, at least visually almost identical, okay? And yeah, the fall time, I'm just measuring it here with a cursor, is about 0.38 milliseconds or 380 microseconds. All I did on the breadboard was change the values of my RC filters. Instead of a 10K resistor, I'm using a 100K and instead of a 10 nano capacitor, I'm using a one nano. 
please note that tau, the time constant of the RC filter is exactly the same as before, but its input impedance is increased tenfold. So that means if I'm, yeah, switch open, charging my capacitor, I'm charging it through 110K. And when I'm discharging it, yeah, switch close, I'm discharging it through 100k. That's only a 10% difference and yeah, it's negligible. You, you can't see it on the oscilloscope. Well, you probably could measure it, but you can't see it. So I'm happy right now and it's time to connect these signals to our Arduino, to our microcontroller. And I've done exactly that. Yeah, you see the two wires here going over to the digital two and digital three pin. And don't worry, uh, there's not much code yet. I'm just <laughs> setting the, up these two pins as digital inputs. Okay, let's single capture and zoom in. And the signal looks still very good. Uh, yeah, let me measure the falling time here. Yeah, change the scale a little bit and move the cursors. All right. Ah. So, still 380 milliseconds. We are golden. Now we can start to write some code to make sense of these signals in our Arduino. Okay, I've uploaded some code on my Arduino and you should see here the output on the serial monitor. And now let's try to actually turn our rotary encoder and what do you know? Seems to work just fine. A little faster, okay, as fast as I can and the other way around. And yeah, the serial uh, monitor is just giving you, yeah, counting up and down, uh, depending on uh, if I turn it clockwise, then it counts up or counterclockwise when I turn it down. Perfect. Let's have a look at the code. There's really not much to the code. I mean, I defined here my two pins I'm using. Yeah, digital pin two for my channel A signal, digital pin three for my channel B signal. And I have here a volatile integer encoding position. Okay, and it's volatile because I will use that in an interrupt routine. In the setup, yeah, I set up my serial interface. I set my two digital pins as input and I initialize the encoder position to zero. And then I attach an interrupt routine to my digital pin for channel A. And this interrupt routine is only called on the falling edge of the signal. And in the interrupt routine itself, there's really nothing to it. <laughs> I mean, this is called every time the signal goes down, I read the signal on my other pin, yeah, from the B channel. And if it's high, then I increment my encoder position. Yeah, that's a clockwise rotation. And if it's low, I decrement my encoder position. Okay, that's a counterclockwise rotation. 
that's all. Okay, uh, uh, well, in the loop itself, sorry, I do a little bit of stuff. I define a static variable here with zero. That's actually the encoder position I've already read. So that's past tense read. And if the encoder position, yeah, which is maintained by the interrupt routine is not equal, the encoder position I've already read, then I set the already read encoder position to the actual encoder position and I print out the encoder position. Yeah, that's it. That's simple. Now for the switch. Uh, same principle, I connected one side of the switch to ground and the other side of the switch via a pull-up resistor, 10K again to the five volt rail and I go on single and I get a signal as <laughs> we already done it with the other two switches. Uh, let's zoom in, it's an unfiltered signal. And I can't see any bounce uh, at all on the falling edge. Let's look at the rising edge. Well, you could imagine that there is some bouncing, but hmm, uh, let's try that again. I mean, this is a hell of a good switch. Okay, single capture again. Nope, this is, oops. Oh yeah, yeah. See that spike? Yeah. But uh, still a very good switch and I think with exactly the same filtering we will be golden. So let me put that on the breadboard. Okay, the same again with the RC filter, same as for the other switches. Single capture. Okay, let's zoom in. And this time, yeah, rising edge, oh, sorry, rising edge first, yeah, absolutely flawless. And falling edge, the same. So let's connect that to the Arduino 2 and write some code around it. And before I forget it, these are the additions on the breadboard. So yeah, the push button switch, momentary switch, yeah, one side goes to ground and the other side first was just pulled up yeah, to the five volt rail we measured here. And afterwards I added the same RC filter like for the other switches. And this would be our, yeah, our switch signal going off to the Arduino. And again, you should see the serial monitor of the Arduino over here. And if I press the button on, off, on, off, and of course my rotary encoder is still working. So yeah, I like that a lot. Let's have a look at the code. Yeah, I added uh, another constant here for my encoder S for switch pin. This is digital pin four. I have another variable here, uh, just a Boolean volatile for use in an interrupt procedure encoder switch. And uh, yeah, I initialize that pin also as input and I initialize my encoder switch variable to false or off. And I attach an interrupt to that switch pin two also on the falling edge, that is when it's pressed. Anyway, uh, the interrupt routine is even simpler. Yeah, encoder interrupt S pin. This simply, uh, every time the button is pressed, it says, yeah, encoder switch is equal to not encoder switch. So yeah, it toggles. And analog in the loop, I have a, yeah, a static bool encoder switch red past tense already set to false. And every time 
that red variable is different from the actual value. I copied the actual value into that encoder switch red variable and I print out on serial uh, if it's true on and if it's false, yes, uh, off. Okay. Um, yeah, some notes at that point. Um, in theory, encoder position here is an, uh, can experience an overflow, but only if you make about 1365 turns, okay, for rotations with the encoder. And if you feel uncomfortable with that because, yeah, well, you might run your program for years or decades, then you can always take a long and then you are in the order of magnitude of, uh, I don't know, uh, 60 or 7 million rotations uh, before you get an overflow. <laughs> um, while I'm doing, why I'm doing this, uh, using this variable here and just incrementing, decrementing it, uh, yeah, it makes the interrupt routine very, very easy. And on the other hand, if you would to, yeah, uh, change the value of that volatile variable while the program is running, Something like, okay, uh, yeah, I read the value out, yeah, copy it into my, where is it, into my read variable, and then I reset the encoder position uh, to zero here. In theory, between these two statements, you could have an interrupt, okay, and uh, you would lose readings. So the uh, code you would probably do is, uh, yeah, position red, you just make here an increment, not equal, but an increment. This could be negative, yeah, and then you would do encoder position equals zero. But the problem with that is uh, interrupt might happen here. Okay, <clears throat> one T, two R. That's why I don't like that uh, solution. It's possible to do, and uh, the risk is small of, uh, you know, uh, losing a pulse, but um, I don't like it. And this is much easier, uh, less code, and in, as I said, uh, uh, if you're paranoid about overflows, uh, simply take a long value here. And that's all about the code, really. And that was Rotary Encoder, yeah, with push button switch, my way. Definitely not the only way, and maybe not even the best way, but the way I like it. Uh, two reasons. Uh, Reason number one, you could use a uh, yeah, out-of-the-box library for rotary encoders. There are at least half a dozen or so available for the Arduino. But uh, you've seen it was a few dozen lines of code, okay? And most of that just housekeeping stuff. So why would you clog up your program memory uh, with a library? I, I don't see the need for it, okay? Uh, second, I don't like software debouncing. Yeah, there are also a lot of libraries that support software debouncing of switches, but uh, especially if you are using interrupts, and again, my preference, my personal preference, I like to prefer interrupt routines for user input. Not, yeah, this endless polling of any inputs in the loop. And if you use software debouncing in conjunction with, yeah, interrupt routines, yeah, you're chopping up your execution of your code. And if you do other time critical stuff, eh, that may not work out so well for you. Uh, 
But again, these are all my personal preferences and uh, yeah, you be the judge. And with that I say bye.